Robert Phillips, please join me on stage. So first of all, Robert's book is out in paperback today. Can I have a little hands up in the audience who's actually read, read the book and not just blog posts of uh, loads of commentators? So you've stif- still definitely got a few more sales uh, of the book to be... Uh, or, to maybe, be or maybe not. Or, 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 or maybe not. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I thought, I, would, I didn't want this to be a, uh, a, an interview about uh, sort of standing up for the PR industry uh, versus uh, your view of the, the death of the PR industry. Yeah. Um, but, but I thought it would be, be useful actually to delve into some of the threats um, that you outline in the, the book uh, and actually let everyone know about um, how we came into contact. Um, so it was an old colleague of, of yours uh, at Edelman. We met in a, an event last year. Um, and she was one of the brightest minds in, in, in mobile, uh, in, in PR. And she just left uh, Edelman um, because she was working on the Unilever account, essentially. Uh, and she wasn't able to do what, uh, what, what she wanted to do. She wasn't able to be agile or iterate. She was stuck in the old world. Um, so I just want to dig into really uh, so what the, the big threat that you talk about is, is, is talent, one of the big threats yeah. uh, in the book. Uh, and actually get your, your view on the, on, on, on the talent question for PL. Well, there are, there are five reasons uh, that I give in the book for why I think there are five existential threats to, to PR. But just to be clear, it's not just a book about PR. And people have got quite obsessed about the PR is dead part of the title rather than the trust me part of the title. And of course, having been in PR, there's no reason why you should trust me. Um, because <laughs> as we know, PR is one of the least trusted professions, if it is a profession, in the world alongside estate agents and politicians. And one of the things that actually puzzled me is why people keep on asking for more trust in sectors that will never be trusted, of which PR is one, just putting it out there. So, um, but the story starts, and the reason that I quit my job as, as uh, the very grandly titled President and Chief Executive of Edelman Europe, the Middle East and Africa, because fundamentally I didn't believe in what I was doing anymore, and I didn't believe in the business model. And the story I recount in the book is a conversation with Richard Edelman, who, despite lots of popular myth, is still a good friend, and we're still in touch, um, about what I saw as these these existential threats to PR. The first was this obsession about outcomes um, uh, and not out, sorry, outputs and not outcomes. The second, as you rightly say, uh, was the lack of depth of talent. The third was about the fact that in an age of data, we simply weren't data ready. Fourth, going back to Robert Rose's point about Edward Bernays, we still live in this sort of 1930s myth of hierarchies and not um, in an age of um, networks. Uh, and, f- and finally, that we were never going to be able to change the world through scaled campaigns, the point about campaigning. Everything was only ever going to happen in increments. And I felt that as, a, as an industry, we'd reached a point where we really need to engineer large scale change. And Richard, looked at me and he said, you know what, Robert, we're sitting on a park bench in Chicago. It was late in the evening on a Sunday. He said, you know what, Robert, you're absolutely right. Everything you say is absolutely right. And I said, okay, Richard, you're the CEO of the world's largest public relations firm. I run 25% of that business. We can change it. And he said, we can't. It will take too long. It will be too disruptive and it will cost too much money. And it was at that point that I decided to, to quit my job. Because what I felt we were doing was not really, it wasn't just whether we were doing the right thing for clients, that's a whole other story. It was actually whether we were doing the right thing for our people, for people like Renata. Whether we were really developing the talent, the skills, the data readiness, the scale, the ability to understand networks, the ability to be much more agile, to use another word that that Robert, Robert used in his presentation, to actually change the industry in which we were leading. And as I go on to say in the book, thinking about the the threats to talent or uh, or the lack of talent, thinking about all these issues, maybe it's time that the generation of pale male and stale 50-somethings who lead the PR industry step aside and let the Renatas of this world take over. Because I think that actually the the leadership of the industry has become part of the problem. Yeah, I completely (laughs) agree. Um, With reference to to, to our first speaker with uh, Robert Rose, we had a a conversation yesterday and... um, Uh, You you made a great comment, actually, that content marketing gives the PR industry yet another excuse not to get its shit together, um, because it's the great saviour of the the industry. What's your view on content marketing? Just to be really clear, that is a tweetable moment. Um, Content (laughs) marketing does give uh, the PR industry an excuse not to get its shit together. 
Um, I think that, that, that a lot of people and a lot of the feedback, the early feedback from the book and, and people like Steve Waddington and Stuart Bruce who are in the audience have both blogged on this, as have you, is that, you, that everyone agrees with a lot of, of, of what the book says. Uh, but then we get into this debate about it doesn't, the, the PR industry is not dead, it's just evolving. Um, and a couple of points on that. First of all, I'm very clear in the book that the PR industry is not dead. I quote the, the entrepreneur Luke Johnson, who said, where there's a buyer, there's a market, and clearly people are still buying PR, and therefore the industry will continue for some time yet. But I don't believe that it's fit for purpose, and I believe it needs to have a radical reappraisal about what it does and how it goes about it. And the, 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 the hanging on to this content word is one of a series of, of, of proof points that the PR industry uses not to have that fracture, not to have that moment where it can go, actually, what we've done before is not good enough. What we need to do in the future is radically different. And that evolution just allows a sort of constant drip, drip, drip of change, of incrementalism, which I don't believe will take the industry or the philosophy of PR far enough. And one example of that, yesterday morning, I, I was copied on an email which was sent to a chief executive of a client that I consult. And, and, and I know you and I disagree on, on AVE, uh, uh, but there was this completely bullshit uh, email saying, you know, we have generated this piece to the chief executive of a mid-cap PLC company. You know, this is a guy responsible for thousands of people and billions of pounds. We have generated a relatively minor piece of coverage. It has 34,000 opportunities to see and a value of 7,047 pounds and 30 pence on an email to a CEO. And people wonder why CEOs don't take PR seriously. It's when they receive stuff like that with nonsense measurement metrics. Just to be, just to, just to be clear on the AVE, AVE yeah. point, because there was something on that, the hashtag, I'm not a fan of AVE. Yeah. But as, you know, with 80% of company value now in intangible assets, um, and the murky world of brand measurement, which is a very murky world, uh, the AVE is one very small uh, measurement. But if it's not producing you know, more, far more significant actually outcomes, which for me as a CMO is lead generation or is new business or is an increase in loyalty in my customer base, then I'm not interested in using PR. But I'm saying the only thing about AVE is if that's the only thing that you can do to justify your existence, then you, you should be dead. What, what, but AVE, by yeah. the way, is the same argument as content marketing. It's just a, a, a so-called evolution of something that, quite frankly, is, is long past its sell by date. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. But in terms of looking at the future, in terms of, because I think I agree with you, you know, your book is very much about business, about actually where you'd like to see business uh, be. And um, for some of you that would have listened to a podcast uh, from Shell Holtz over the weekend, which, uh, what, what was his description of you? Uh, a breathless, liberal, high school intellectual. Yes, right. So I was, I, I was, I was, I was wondering what, what Robert Phillips was going to turn up today. Was it the, the breathless, uh, liberal, high school intellectual? Just, or was just, it just, on, just on Shell Holtz, by the way, I'm not sure how much store you should take from someone who says, we shouldn't listen to Phillips. He says that climate change is a big deal. We all know that climate change isn't a big deal anymore. I give you shell holes. <laughs> okay, but I'll 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 I'll, I'll repost with a with a with a question from Shell actually um, that it sent me uh, sent me overnight, and um, he he basically said to me, um, if a company has adopted the public leadership model, mm. uh, or what John McKay calls conscious capitalism, or for example, you know what Porter and McKay call shared value, yeah. right, which is what you base a lot of your feelings on, um, what term? Sorry, how? I'm just trying to read here. Um, uh, if it no longer... I may be breathless, it, but he stutters. It, it, <laughs> I stutter in his question. Um, but if a company has adopted this new model, actually, how does it tell its story to important stakeholders who, A, may not understand the company's character, B, may disagree or outright oppose to some of the company's activities, or C, simply aren't listening through any of the channels that the company is using? Um, you know, does PR and communication still have a place in that wonderfully new, evolved company? And there, you have the fundamental disagreement between how I would see the world, which is flatter, more networked, more participatory, where no one is in control, and where probably Shell sees the world, where you're still trying to manage the message, craft the narrative, land the story, tell people what they need to think. He's still living in the age of Edward Bernays. I'm trying to get us all to live in the age of Edward Snowden. And... Um, and so, so the answer to, to Shell's question, and uh, one of my colleagues, Christine Armstrong, is, is here with me today. Christine and I and others at Jericho are working with a number of organizations that aren't trying to tell the story, 
but are trying to explore a shared story with stakeholders. And guess what? They're trying to explore a shared story with people who violently disagree with them. So for those of you that haven't looked, and I'm sure that's nearly everyone in this room, take a look at www.responsibletax.org.uk. It's a program that we're running with KPMG and with the think tank COVID, Common Vision. And what we've done is bring a whole range of dissenting voices together to explore what responsible tax looks like. And that really begins to address um, what Shell is asking. This isn't KPMG's story. Yes, KPMG has a point of view. Yes, KPMG has some very firm principles, good principles, on taxation just as it does on the living wage. But it also understands that it will not learn if it does not listen. And that means it has to listen to dissenting voices. So people like ActionAid, people like Share Action, people like Tax Justice Network and Tax Research UK have all been part of this process. You know what? We filmed the process. Some may call that content marketing. We just call it just part of what we're doing, right? And that, that process started off as a Chatham House rule online conversation, a series of roundtables, series of events. Now it's publicly available. This is the way that companies can discover what their future story looks like, not by telling people what they think and what people ought to think, but by co-producing it with real people and meeting the activism of society with activism of their own. So what would you, you've, you've claimed it in the book, but there's a few people in the room, obviously, that, that, that haven't uh, read the book. For those people that, that, that do work, either in agencies or uh, in-house uh, currently, um, and, you know, and, and need to do that, quite frankly, because they're enslaved because of the economic reality of their lives, um, which a few of us are. Um, you know, so what would your advice be to, to them in their organisations about how, about how they can go and help change their organisations so they do have an impact on what they do rather than what they say or what others say about Yeah, and, and, and at, the heart of, at the heart of the book is a plea that we move from words to actions and base future communication on actions, not words, on what we do, not what we say. Again, just to be really clear, this is not saying that all communications is dead, quite the opposite. Um, I'm very optimistic about the communications sector and call for, uh, uh, call for a shift from chief communications officers to becoming more like chief community organisers or chief citizenship officers. So one of the, the things I explore in the book is this notion of public leadership. So as, as, as Jonathan says, we've moved from, uh, we've moved from uh, it moves from a book about public relations into a book about business, society and therefore leadership. And it, it looks at what future leadership should be, and that's activist, co-produced, citizen-centric, and society first. These are all values that a lot of us in this room will share. They're rooted in the Aristotelian principles of common good, just doing the right thing, which I'm sure on a good day all of us want to do. And the chief communications officer, who can evolve into the chief citizenship officer or the chief community organiser, can embrace this thinking, can embrace those four pillars of public value, uh, of public leadership, and can, can, can organise themselves so that they look at the organisation that they serve much more as a social movement rather than as a hierarchical organisation. And within that, communications is, of course, pretty fundamental. But I disagree profoundly with what Robert Rose was saying. That has to be based on radical honesty and radical transparency. We are in the truth business. And one of the reasons that PR is dead is because we've got to get out of this myth that we're not in the truth business, that we were never in the truth business, that it was okay to spin a story. And, and that really is... And that really... And, and just actually on that point, okay, because um, this, this wasn't a setup, but, you know, who said this, right? We act with integrity. We maintain the highest ethical standards and transparency in our work, in our, in our dealings with customers, partners, stakeholders, and fellow employees. We keep our commitments. We are honest fair and trustworthy. Enron? No. Barclays? No. Thomas Cook? Yeah. Thomas Cook. We keep our commitments. We are honest, fair and trustworthy. What an epic fucking failure. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with the people in this room. Let's start thinking about how we don't become co-conspirators in putting shit like that on the Thomas Cook website. And that was still on the Thomas Cook website after the scandal of the past two, three, four weeks. And that speaks to why we've ended up in this crazy managerial culture whereby too many CEOs, this is not to be the blame of the PR industry as such, but too many business leaders and indeed politicians, and we'll get onto the Ed Stone in a minute, but 
too many politicians and business leaders turn first to their lawyers and then to their PR people to try and tell them how to de-risk something or to do what is right. You know when you are doing the right thing. But the problem is, with organisations like Thomas Cook and maybe RBS in its low day, you know, you, what, what happens is they so, become so scared of doing the wrong thing, they forget how to do the right thing. And actually, going back to your question about what role can communicators play, they, don't, they shouldn't be the proxy conscience of the company, but they should make sure that the company does tell the truth, does radicalise honesty, and does radicalise transparency within its organisation. Okay. So I'd love to open this up a little bit in the last five minutes uh, to, the, to the audience, actually. We've got a couple of mics uh, roaming around, uh, hopefully, uh, in, in the room um, to see if uh, any of you guys uh, have, uh, have got a question for Robert. Any, any hands up? On your row, Nick. Thank you. If you can just uh, introduce yourself and yeah, say who sure. you are. Hello, um, Rachel Miller, All Things I See. Um, so I'm reading the book at the moment. And it is the most frustrating book I've ever read. Uh, I keep putting it down. I think I really, really want to read this. I help fund it, for goodness sake, so I really should read this. Um, and the view on internal communication is just... Oh, we haven't got long enough. Uh, we need more than a couple of days, I think. Um, I'm frustrated by it because the lack of information about employee engagement is just incredible. I think there's a, a sentence which is a very provocative read, shall we say. Um, I didn't disagree with everything, um, but the information about employee engagement where... Um, I've actually written it down because it irritated me so much. Um, so employee engagement and internal communications. The former has, in recent years, become a fashionable misnomer for the latter. Large companies rush to monetize this new space. And that's true, people are monetizing employee engagement and also internal comms, but some people are doing really, really good stuff. and. The essay from Lucy Adams at the back, the, um, to the former HR director of the BBC, for people who haven't read the book, um, and I featured her, on, I write a blog on internal comms, I featured her, and she described talking about um, the pompousness of communication inside organisations, and she's not wrong. But you missed a massive trick in, it was just doom and gloom, and you're writing off PR and writing off internal comms, and there was no hope, if you're reading that as an internal comms professional, God, it was depressing. Um, so thank you for making me think. Um, but God, you irritated me. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. I didn't quite get the question, Rachel. But so uh, the question was: if, what's, if, what's if the, the hope question, for internal comms? If the question was, did I set out to irritate Rachel? The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> if the question was, did I set out to provoke a debate about legitimate communications, truth, trust, and transparency? The answer is yes. Um, and a lot of people have spent the past few weeks and months telling me the book that I should have written. Um, but let's be very clear about this. This was never intended to be, um, it was never intended to be a handbook or a how-to guide about the future communications. That wasn't the book I wanted to write, nor is it the book that I ended up writing. Margaret Heffernan, an author who I re respect a, a, a huge amount, and quite frankly, if you don't read my books, you should certainly read hers, um, called mine a, a, a thrilling revelation, uh, and it was very passionate, and that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, Arun Suderman in the Holmes Report said it was very funny, which was actually the best thing. Um, but it was designed to provoke, and if, if it didn't have a chapter on, on how to do employee engagement, then, um, then uh, I can only apologise, but it was never my intention to do that anyway. But I would read, and you should read, the chapter by Lucy Adams. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with the book, the book was crowdfunded. Um, I started off with a, a grown-up publisher, uh, one of the big publishing houses, but it was like working in the 14th century. So if you think that PR is dead, publishing certainly completely fucked. Um, and you can tweet that as well also. Um, we, we, I turned to a crowdfunder, a crowdfunding platform, a crowdfunding publisher called Unbound. The, the CEO also has a, a, a chapter in the book. And we began to welcome the voices of the crowd into the conversation. And we ran workshops with people who were past the crowd. And we went and interviewed people who were past the crowd. And members of the crowd started contributing essays. One of my favourites is from the ambassador to Lebanon, Tom Fletcher. I've never met Tom. He wrote a blog post and it said, if PR is dead, then old diplomacy is certainly dead too. Because diplomacy, he wrote, was born in an age of monarchies and great states. 
and basically is full of meaningless platitudes. In its form, communiques and summits are completely and utterly redundant. And if you ask yourself the question, who will influence the, tw um, the 21st century more? Will it be Britain or will it be Google? We all know the answer to that question. So what started coming out through the book writing process with all these people who wanted to tell their own stories about where they believed their industry, their sector, or indeed their specialism had gone wrong. And Lucy Adams, the former HR director of the BBC, is one of those uh, contributors, and I urge you to read her work. By the way, if you think I have a go at internal communications, wait till you read the bit on CSR. <laughs> I hate CSR. <laughs> CSR has taken something that should be all about leadership and made it into a machine of unnecessary bureaucratic compliance. And, and we, again, as responsible communicators, need to break out of that lockjam. Robert, unfortunately, we've run out of time, as ever, on these, uh, these things. I just want to thank you. I think most people in the room uh, would agree that rather than being the uh, Achilles heel of the, the PR industry, you're actually a... Uh, vision for the future uh, for the communications industry and for, for business. So I want to thank you uh, very much for, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.